When he joined the notorious security police in the 1970s, Paul Erasmus found himself at the center of history. He was probably too young and inexperienced to know it. But what quickly became clear to him was that he was in a position of power and influence. For a young man of Aldo's are 21, 22, somewhere around there, to have this literally James Bond type stuff and a license to kill and operate above the law was quite something. It was a power trip and it didn't just stop there. Um, eventually what started off as more light-hearted, dirty tricks, if you will, uh, graffiti spraying and that type of stuff, um, you know, started to assume new dimensions where cars were burnt out and assassinations started to take place. Within a few years, um, I'd been already given several orders to take out, eliminate, neutralize, permanently remove from society. All of these terms being a way of being told to kill people. And I think in my entire career, which was relatively short, I was only in the security branch for 17 or 18 years. I think in total I was given something like 15 orders um, whereby I was told to go and kill somebody. Born in February 1956 in Johannesburg, Paul wanted a simple life as a poet. But the world in which he found himself, it would seem, had other ideas. Think about this. From the day that you were born, you you were subjected to some form of state propaganda. Um, the history that we were taught at school was, was changed and altered to suit nationalist philosophy, the so-called thing about the clash between blacks and whites. We were taught at school, for example, all the way up to matric level, that the whites had arrived in the Cape, um, never met any of the more sophisticated uh, Bantu or black tribes like the Zulus, for example, which were um, 1,500 kilometers away, but only met these um, little groups of black people. And the clash came when whites moved north and the blacks were moving south. Now, the blacks, for example, were never moving south. They'd been in, in what is now Zululand, KwaZulu Natal. They'd been there prior to Shaka Zulu going back to his grandfather, who I think was Dinger's way. They'd been there for, for many, many years. So, you know, just that aspect of, of the history that we were taught, this inevitable clash between black and white, was a, a subversion, if you, or if you wish, a perversion of history. Religion also became a big factor. Christianity was, um, I'm not knocking Christianity at all, but it was shoved down our throats. We had an air of superiority imbued into us. Um, I learned that in the police. And it was part of our culture um, as white South Africans, middle class, whoever you were. You had black people working for you as servants, and you were in charge of them. Um, a white kid in a, in a white household would tell the, the terminology then was uh, the garden boy or the kitchen girl, uh, they weren't even acknowledged as, as adults. Um, you would tell them what to do and they would be in trouble if they didn't do it because you were white and they were black. This was apartheid. And that's how things worked. And we didn't actually formulate even opinions about it. Even at work, white supremacy was the norm. When I joined the police, it was then entrenched in police regulations and police law. And that was that all white members of the force had control over all black members of the force, irrespective of rank. But what's still unclear is why an aspiring poet chose to become a policeman. There was nothing really, I think, in my makeup that significantly led to the decision for me to join, a, uh, join the South African police. 
I mentioned the call-up papers, you know, that was very telling because none of us, very few South Africans, wanted to go to the army. Um, once you were there, yeah, and once you were out, different story. You were nicely indoctrinated and channeled and some will say brutalized into uh, towing the party line. And of course, all of that emotion was gone, that feeling and, and passion that I had to write poetry and that. I mean, I don't think there was two days in a row where we didn't see death in some form, not a nice situation, but um, exciting. And for an adrenaline junkie like me, it was yet another high. Two years after Paul joined the police force, Soweto students took part in what became a historical demonstration. The South African police resorted to shotguns in the Johannesburg township. The blacks, so oddly obedient for so long, were beginning to lose patience. The young particularly were angry. It was on the 16th of June 1976. Learners revolted against Afrikaans as a language of instruction in black schools. Paul was thrown in at the deep end. When I got there that morning, the policeman was standing, the whole damn station was on parade. So we got ready and waited in the afternoon. Then we were loaded into the same trucks that used to cart the prisoners around and, and black people that had been arrested for, for pass offences. And they took us to, funnily enough, John Foster Square. We sat in this freezing cold parade room. And from time to time, they just like grab a bunch of a hundred guys or so, or 50 guys, and load them up into vans and race them to the various townships surrounding Johannesburg, where writing had broken, either broken out or was about to break out, or whatever. And one thing was very clear, not just in retrospect now, but it was clear to all of us that nobody knew what the hell was going on. I ended up in Alexander Township and the first time in my life fired a gun at a human being in anger. They were looting the shops and uh, a few businesses in the township. At that time you had these what are now known as spaza shops, little informal trading houses as it were, where the residents, the black people at that time could um, buy bread and cigarettes. And, and taverns um, or shabines where you could get booze. These places were being attacked and looted. And I found myself in a group of, quite a substantial group of policemen. One of these looters ran out, I think he was probably full of alcohol. And we opened fire, including me. And this guy just went down in a hail of, of bullets. Um, at night, you know, the sound of those rifles is something else. I mean, this was one of the most powerful assault rifles in the world at that time, a 7.62. This guy must have been hit about probably 20 times and we were all standing there with our very pathetic torches. And here was his body lying, and this guy was literally in pieces. It was only his clothes that was holding him together. He was permeated with, with bullet holes. Um, and I've always been pretty good with, with shooting. And then, in fact, I did combat shooting at one time. I knew damn well that one of those bullets was mine, which wasn't lost on me. But um, somebody out there might ask, yeah, how did I feel? Um, I think honestly, elation, you know, it contributed, like this bastard was looting, he's breaking the law, rioting and so on. He deserved what he got. No sympathy, nothing at the time? No, it, it did affect me. I agonized. I mean, I, I've always been, I think, a very deep thinker about a lot of things, um, especially since that time. Uh, and like I said earlier on, the the experience the following week of of seeing all these bodies, deaths, uh, the result of all this carnage and chaos, 
you know, brought together the central points left me absolutely shattered. After the 1976 student uprising, life was never the same. I never slept. I stopped laughing. That I remember. I'd, uh, my music, I've always been very much into music. My music taste changed instantly. I'd got away from this wild, heavy rock music that I was into in party mode, and I started to listen to Leonard Cohen and quiet, uh, more soul-searching, deep type of stuff. <laughs> For more, go to ewn.co.za.